thank you so much for joining us, Ant, um, on, on the podcast today. Um, uh, I think it'd be great to start off if, if you could give us a little bit of an introduction about yourself and, and, and just sort of tell everybody uh, a little bit about your story and, and, and what you do in the, the L&D space. Yeah, thanks. Um, so, um, yeah, I started off actually, um, uh, my background is in design and then I quite quickly transitioned into kind of training. I was teaching some of the design software I'd been learning about at university. So I spent many years as a classroom trainer. trainer. And then after a few years, kind of realized um, those two um, skill sets aligned quite nicely uh, when it came to kind of designing e-learning. So um, bringing the kind of um, design skills into the kind of L&D environment. And so for many years, I was designing um, e-learning. Um, and this is the kind of quick version and realized that, you know, probably, probably embarrassingly, almost after a decade, I guess, of doing this, I was just kind of cranking out training that wasn't actually delivering business results. Yeah. It looked great. I was a designer of all my, I, mean, I you know, really prided myself on creating great looking training. I learned how to use the, the, the development tool. So it worked, you know, it was robust, it, it functioned properly. Um, and it did everything that the client asked me that it would do, that I put, put all their content in, I, you know, made it, you know, engaging in inverted commas and I, you know, yeah. made it work. But quite quickly realized that um, I wasn't, yeah, delivering business value, which is why, you know, I was being hired in the first place. And, and this started off in the corporate world to begin with. And then when I started freelancing, I was seeing some of the same patterns um, you know, coming to the fore then. And so in the last few years, I've really focused more on um, consulting, really. And when I talk about consulting, I'm talking about actually having those very strategic conversations at the beginning of any learning or training intervention to figure out what is the real problem behind um, the, why, you know, why are we having this conversation in the first place? Why do you want this training that you've come to me with so yeah the last few years i've really focused a lot more on on that kind of front-end analysis and the consult the performance consulting piece at the beginning of a project and, and so actually i'm still in, in in many ways exactly the same as i was five years ago i'm still a, a training designer or a learning designer or an instructional designer whatever you want to call me but the solutions that i now deliver are very very different because we do a lot more analysis and problem solving at the beginning to make sure that what we're going to design is actually solve a business problem rather than just delivering what what, what was asked of me. So I now do that as a freelancer. Um, I'm British, but now I live in Australia and I do it over here. Um, and what I'm whilst that's paying the bills, what I'm really passionate about is teaching what I'm learning about this stuff. So I, I have a newsletter, I write daily, um, put a lot of content out there. My main, my main kind of channel is LinkedIn, really. Um, but I, I write this daily email, I've got a list of about 1500 learning designers who I write to every day, just with what really I'm trying to share the journey of what, um, yeah, of, of what I'm going through, what I'm seeing every day. So the, the experiences I'm having with clients, um, things that are working, you know, for, with my clients, things that are not working, things that I'm testing out that, you know, we've had successes with, uh, and just different things that I'm seeing, different trends, different insights that I'm seeing. As somebody who's you know been working in L and D now for you know approaching twenty years, um, just trying to share that with others because whilst I can help clients on a one to one basis, I really feel that my highest contribution is to help you know the industry as a whole. And, and if I can help you know a thousand instructional designers achieve something, you know they're going to go off and work with a thousand different clients, and I'm going to have a much bigger impact than working with one client at a time. So my ultimate goal. Whilst I'm doing client work in the, in the short term, my ultimate goal is to to really help uh, the industry at scale. Yeah, wow, that's amazing. And I think everyone's been in that world where maybe you start a new job and you do some of that induction training, and and it, yeah, it ticks the box. Maybe it looks pretty, but does it really deliver that sort of that sort of value? Um, I'd be really interested to know, I guess, um, from, from your perspective, what, what are some of the challenges that you, 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 you sort of your clients have faced or that you see sort of pop up where you, where you found, hey, I can deliver a lot of value by solving these problems. Is there any, any recurring themes there or, or anything that pops up when you're trying to solve some of those business objectives? Yeah, I mean, every single client will, have a, will, will come to you with a different need. Whether they can articulate it or not is a different thing. Most, most of the time they haven't even thought about it. You know, either you've got two scenarios, you've got the kind of classic scenario where 
somebody in a high, higher position within the business has uh, asked somebody lower down to go out and you know find somebody to build you the training so they get you know given the the slide deck they get given the name of the subject matter expert and they say right go out and find somebody yeah. who can build me this training uh, and and you know the biggest problem is with with regard to that is that the person that they find to to, to to build the training whether it's internal or you know externally hiring an agency or a freelancer is that nine times out of ten i'd say even more than that maybe 99 times out of 100 the person that they're speaking to doesn't have the performance consulting skills to successfully identify what the root cause of the problem is. So, you know, conversations quickly escalate into how many slides are there? Uh, what color do you want the buttons? Um, do you want videos in there? You know, how, how many modules should we make? You know, uh, all those questions are around the specifics of what the client wants when actually what they really need to be doing is asking some deeper que questions to figure out why do you want this training in the first place? Um, so that's that's the piece of the jigsaw that's missing. Um, and that's really what I'm trying to, to, to help share, share with the world, really, is that, that whether it's that one individual instructional designer's uh, responsibility to do that performance consulting or not is a different question. Yeah. I'm not su suggesting that every instructional designer needs to do that, but it needs to be done regardless yeah. of whether that person does it or somebody else. So you've got to have that piece. Otherwise, um, the, the solutions that we're designing, they're just not going to be effective. And I was actually thinking about this this morning. I was thinking about it, comparing it to web design. And um, if you think about training design and web design, you could almost, because um, you've got a, a techie background, so I'm, I'm, you yeah. know, you're familiar with building That's websites cool. and stuff, right? If you build a website, if you build a, a crappy website, most people can navigate their way through it, find what they're looking for, and they'll be on their way. It's not going to be a website that they go back to and use regularly, or they, they, they maybe they will need to use it regularly because it, you know it, it's the internet of the company, and that's where they have to go to get the processes, or the you know they have to use it every day. It's not a pleasant experience. The problem with training, though, is that if we build, you know, I get clients coming to me all the time, and they say, you know, can you convert my uh, seventy slides of PowerPoint into an e-learning course? You know, maybe like a 45 minute e-learning course or something every time a staff member sits and goes through that 45 minutes of training we're creating a deficit where that company is losing money for that 45 minutes we're paying for people to be off the job they're sitting on that e-learning course let's imagine you've got 100,000 people taking the course that's i can't do the maths but imagine 45 minutes per person that's a hell of amount of time to be not product not productive in their jobs not to mention you've got the additional costs of the opportunity cost. What would they, uh, well, yeah, that is the opportunity cost. Sorry, I'm, I'm, I'm talking rubbish. So that's the opportunity, co opportunity cost. What would they be doing if they were spending that time otherwise? What else could they be doing in that 45 minutes? But then you've got the reputational damage as well. So that, those 100,000 people are now thinking, wow, that was the worst 45 minutes I've ever spent. It was totally useless. It didn't help me do my job. And next time somebody suggests I should do an e-learning course or do a training course, I'm not going to be very excited about it because my last experience was bad. Um, and then you've got not only that, you've got the cost of development and the, the, amount, of, the amount of work that goes into actually building a solution. So if you factor in all those costs, there's a huge amount of um, yeah, value being lost there, really. Um, I, I've been talking to somebody else about this recently. We, we, we called it value debt. You know, we're accumulating this value debt where we're, we're sucking the life out of you know, these businesses based on you know, these training experiences that we're designing. And you know, if, if only we had those conversations at the start better to figure out what the solutions were, then that wouldn't happen. And, and we could make sure that, you know, what I would imagine would happen is that 90% of the training requests that come in would actually be rejected. And we'd, we'd decide, <laughs> actually, there are better solutions than training for this. You don't need training to solve this problem. Here's something else you can do that's a lot quicker, a lot more efficient, you know, effective, going to cost you a lot less money. It might not even be training related. It might be something to do with improving the process or improving the tools that they're using or uh, helping improve um, staff motivation or something like that. Um, but then the remaining 10%, we can really uh, make sure that the solutions are effective and are actually delivering a return on investment for our clients. So I'm not sure if I answered your question, but that's kind yeah, of in a is. roundabout way some of, the, some of the things that I'm seeing. Yeah, that, that, that's really interesting. Um, and I, I think what you've said sort of about that training having an impact and I guess that um, the sort of the bad taste that it can leave within the employee's mouth when they go through and they do something, and go, oh my God, it's such a waste of time. What am I doing? Or I've done this before. Why do I have to do it again? 
um, it's really interesting. Well, what I'd love to learn a little bit more about is, is sort of, so you said you, you consult around finding out some of those problems and how do you, how do you distinguish a problem from maybe a symptom? Because something that we see quite a lot of is, Hey, this is the pain we're feeling is here, but it's actually caused by a different problem that, that might be over here. Um, do you sort of work with the clients to, to uncover, Hey, these, these might be some of the problems that you're experiencing. Um, and, and then sort of try to help them solve that throughout that training sort of uh, creation process. Yeah, exactly. So we start off with the goal. That's that's the first thing I would always start with is identifying what do you want to achieve. And that usually falls into one of two categories. I can't think of any situations where it wouldn't fall into one of these two categories. And if I, I call it like a pain or a gain. So the pain is like a problem that they're currently experiencing. Or it might be a problem that they, they, they're anticipating that they might feel in the future. So if it's a, a new product or a new process or... Um, yeah, a new piece of software that the company is rolling out, something like that. You know, yes, okay, we haven't currently got any problems with this because it's a new thing, but what other problems that you anticipate we might have? You know, a new product, our customer service staff don't know the complexities of the product and therefore can't support people on the on the phone when they can't call up about it. So that would be a problem, but then the or a pain, sorry. And then the gain would be, right, we spotted an opportunity. We think that we can improve sales by, you know, introducing this new process or uh, whatever it is. So it kind of falls into two camps, but you start off with that goal. And once you've identified the goal, you, you're planting a flag in the ground really. And you're saying, whatever we do, we're going to focus on that goal as a team. So you, you're immediately setting expectations with the clients, with the subject matter experts, with whichever stakeholders you're working with to make sure you're focused, uh, to make sure you, as a team, you're aligned with that, with achieving that goal. That's got to be the number one thing that we're going for. Anything else is, is secondary. Once you've identified the goal, then you can start figuring out, you know, how do we how do we achieve that goal? So, you know, for me, it would a lot of that would, would focus on, you know, um, human performance. So, so what are people supposed to be doing in their jobs for us to achieve that goal? Oh, they need to follow this six-step process or oh, they need to be, um, you know, using this piece of software, or you know, they, they need to be practicing this thing. So, and that's where we start figuring out which solutions make most sense to help people achieve the, the goal. Um, but it, it can be, you know, it can be other other things as well. So it could be, you know, the process isn't very well defined, or there's a problem in the process. So by going through that performance consulting approach, we're really taking a step step back from the the learning, development, and training world, and we're saying this potentially could be much bigger than training it's very it's almost arrogant for us to think that training is the solution to to a business problem you know and and it's almost and it's naive to think that the client has the skills to figure out um, the best solution for their problem you know Mm -hmm. we need people who are skilled in that role as a performance consultant to, to, to figure out what the problem is first or what the the opportunity is and then design solutions to address that yeah, absolutely. That's really interesting because it's it's a skill set in itself, right? To go and and diagnose those problems or opportunities and sort of bring them to the forefront and then work out where where, where do we actually put our flag? You know, do, what what is our goal? Um, it's a pretty tricky thing to do. Not many people are very good at it. But what, what's the hardest part? Would you say what's what's the part that you sort of think uh, this is the biggest challenge when we're doing that? Um, there's there's a few pieces. Um, to the jigsaw that you need to put in place before you can even have that conversation um, or before you can have that conversation effectively. Um, I'll give you an example. I'm working on a client project at the moment and I was kind of drafted in a little bit later into the process. So they already agreed on how many modules the training was going to be. Mm. Uh, they'd agreed the scope of work. They'd agreed the format, all that kind of stuff. And so once that's be, once those expectations have been set, it's very difficult to turn around and say, "Well, training is not going to fix your problem. You're going to need you're going to need uh, you know to improve the software, or you're going to need to have better leadership within the business." You know, once the expectations of the clients have been set, it's very difficult to, difficult to change that later on. So you've got to kind of get your ducks in a row, if you like, when it comes to having that type of conversation. So the first thing is actually, I think it's an in, internal. Uh, shift you have to make in your own mind so and that's involves I think a lot of courage Um, you know you've got to go into conversations being aware that 
you're not going to know the answer. You know, it's very difficult for uh, somebody who's very, you know, pe- I, I worked for many years as, as an instructional designer to get to a point when somebody came to me with their slide deck and said, can you turn this into a, a snazzy learning course? Yeah. Now, I worked for nearly a decade to get to a point where I could say with confidence, yeah, I can take this and I can make this look amazing. It's going to work on your LMS. It's going to be really engaging. It's going to have yeah. videos. It's going to be, mo- you know, broken down into micro learning. So I got to a point where I was like, no, I feel confident doing this. And I had to, when I started focusing on goals and business objectives and consulting and all this stuff, I had to kind of get rid of that a little bit because, and it's, it was it was very, um, what's the word I'm trying to trying to say? It was very, I had, to, I had to become very vulnerable again because when you're entering that type of conversation and you're focusing on a business goal, you're putting yourself into a situation where you don't know what the solution is going to be. And you might not know what the solution is going to be for another six weeks. <laughs> so you're yeah. going to a conversation with a client and you're saying, look, I don't know what the solution is, but let's work through this together. And it, that comes, I think, with experience and practice. So it takes a little time to, to go through the process a few times. And to, to, you know, it's, it's a bit of a there's, a, there's a moment where you have to jump into the deep end and say, look, it's a leap of faith. I don't know, I don't know if this is going to pan out. And in six week time, the client might turn around and say, look, we just want our bloody learning course. Can we can we go ahead with what we asked for in the first place? But you have to kind of, well, for me, I, it was a case of, it was, a, it was a leap of faith. It was a case of saying, I'm going to be courageous. I'm going to um, attempt to do this properly. And I'm going to focus on the business goal rather than just what the client has diagnosed as the, the, the solution that they want. Um, so that's the first part. It's the mindset. And the second part, I think, would be the kind of, you could almost call that mindset part. I was going to say the second part is positioning. And I was going to say, you could almost say the, the first part is actually internal positioning. You're positioning in your own mind to say, um, I'm positioning myself as somebody who's going to help you solve the problem rather than somebody who's going to uh, just take your slides and build your training. The mm-hmm. second part is the external positioning. So how what, what is the um, perception that I'm giving to somebody when I start a project with them? Uh, does my website say I design beautiful e-learning courses, or does my website say I will work with you to achieve, a, a, you know, a, a satisfactory business outcome? It might, if you're internal, it might be your job title or the, your, your company, your, your department name, or it might be, you know, I see a lot of these um, training request forms where people are asking internal stakeholders to fill out a training request form, but the the, the clue is in the title, right? If I'm giving you a training request form, I'm asking you to tell me what training I'm going to build you. Whereas, you know, what, what we should really be doing is asking them, you know, what is the problem you're facing and how can I help you solve that problem? So instead of leading them down the path of what training do you want, we're leading them down the path of what change do you want to see in your business? So that's, you know, another part of the jigsaw. If you don't do these things before you have the conversations, when they sit in front of you to give you the slides, they've already made up their mind that you're going to be building the me learning. And that's that's kind of what we're what we're kind of doing sort of thing so yeah there's a few things in place that you have to get right before you can successfully execute those conversations yeah because i guess you're you're solving a business objective right you're going in there and you're going well this is it and that scariness of not knowing you know when we pull the curtain back we don't actually know where this is going to lead and it, it might be uh really easy to solve or it might be really really tricky to solve and 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 we don't know um so there's definitely yeah definitely a component of courage um within that for sure i'm really curious that after you've sort of gotten through that I guess, discovery process and, and we've worked out what those business objectives are, what are the sort of learning activities or the, the types of learning that you find are highly effective to solve those problems? And I, I'm assuming they probably change depending on the problem, right? Um, but but what, what do you sort of find works and, and maybe what do you find that doesn't work from a learning activity perspective? Yeah, well, this is only something I've kind of really discovered in the last few years, but um I'm really starting to try and um, flip the the kind of paradigm from how I delivered training before. Um, so I think in you know before I knew any better, it was a case of taking the information that we wanted to teach people. We wanted people to we. I, let me start again. I think the first the first point is that there was a belief. I think that the the problem that we have or the problem that our you know, learners have is that they don't know the right information. So I think that's an assumption that we all have, you know, I, I think we all, as human beings, I think we sometimes think that 
if something's not working properly, it's because people don't know how to do it properly. Um, and so I've started to question that assumption and, you know, really flipping the model and saying, well, maybe there are other problems in, in addition to that, right? Maybe they, maybe they know how to do it, but they're not motivated to do it. Or maybe they know how to do it, but there's something restricting them, i.e. You know, they don't have the right username and password to get into the software, so they don't bother logging in. Or they've got pressure from management to get through a certain number of phone calls every every hour, so you know they're not following the process correctly. Or yeah, they don't wear their safety goggles because every time they put them on, their, their um, fellow colleagues take the mickey out of them because they look silly. I mean, there's, there's all... Number, there's, there's so many reasons why somebody might not be doing something right in their job beyond the fact that they don't know how to do it. Obviously, knowing how to do it is important, but it could be one of many things. So I think, first of all, by questioning that, you know, and, and I, it, for, I, for me, it falls into four categories. So you've got knowledge, skills, um, environment and motivation. So um, and this is taken from a concept called uh, action mapping by a lady called Kathy Moore. Um, but she developed this this process basically that you can take a problem from start to finish or a, a training requirement from start to finish uh, through. Uh, but you you can break them down to those four categories essentially. So is this a knowledge problem? Is it a skill problem? Is it a, an environmental problem? Or is it a motivational problem? And nine times out of ten, it's it's all of them, right? It's not it's not you know maybe they don't know it, but also they have never had a chance to practice it. Yeah. And then they don't not only have they not had the chance to practice it, they haven't got the right environment supporting them in in doing it properly. Um, so yeah, I think that's that's the first thing. So going back to your question about solutions, I've really tried to kind of flip the model a little bit. And rather than saying, right, this is a knowledge problem, let's you know feed them with information. So that was the, the typical approach to training: is we'll put everything into a slide deck and we'll sit them, sit them through you know, 57 slides, or it might be an e-learning course. They sit through the 57 e-learning slides, or it might be a, a classroom virtual session. They sit through their two-hour Zoom meeting and they consume. It's all about consumption, consuming this information. And we might do an assessment at the end to prove that they've actually understood it and remember it. And so rather than following that approach, I'm starting to think about performance versus knowledge. So rather than what do people need to know to do something, Let's start off with what they need to do and we'll work backwards from there. So if somebody, so let me give you an example. I'm working on a project with a, a marketing team at the, at the moment and they came to me with, um, it was like a it was like five day, four and a half days of um, virtual workshops. So they've converted all this classroom training into virtual workshops when COVID happened. So they've got four and a half days of like these Zoom sessions, right? It's, it's, it's a lot of, you know, and they're getting a lot of complaints, people saying it's just too much, it's too overwhelming. You know, we, we get through a few hours each day and it's just so much to consume. So they came to me and they said, look, can you convert all this to e-learning? We figure that if people do this, you know, and they have this access to this whenever they want, they could do it an hour at a time or they can, you know, break it down and, and take, you know, consume as much as they need at any given time. But then when we did some performance consulting and we looked at it, we figured out, well, what is it you're trying to achieve? What they were trying to achieve was help people fill out this form properly. I mean, it sounds silly for four and a half days training, but that's what it equated to. They were yeah. trying to write a brief, like a marketing brief. Mm. And these, these staff were not filling, you know, they were, weren't writing effective briefs, basically. So we worked backwards from there. And we said, right, rather than just cramming all this stuff into e-learning courses, which incidentally, I would, you know, if I if I could if I'd have taken that on, I could have made a ton of money because I could have made, you know, six hours of e-learning and got paid an absolute fortune for. Yeah, but absolutely. you know, deep down in my gut, I knew it wasn't going to actually solve the problem. So um, I call it that having a that icky feeling where you just feel like a bit gross about what you're building because you know it's not actually going to do anything. Mm. Um, so yeah, rather than going down that path, we said, right, what what is it that we want people to do? Right, we want them to be able to fill in this form correctly. Right, so um, let's give them an opportunity to try it. Let's give them a case study. Let's get them to practice writing this out. Now, if they get stuck, if they don't know how to do it, we'll give them the supporting material to teach them how to do it. But let's not treat them all as um, you know the same. Let's treat them all individually. Let's give them the task, which is how we work in everyday life. You know, if you don't know how to boil an egg, you go away and you figure it out we don't sit through a presentation to learn and then go and try it. We try it first and then we figure out the bits that are missing. Absolutely. So yeah. let's give them this brief to, to write. Let's give them an opportunity to practice it. And then we will um, provide them with the supporting material if they need it to help them write the brief. 
And so the solutions I'm now designing are very much focused on the behaviors that we want to see people demonstrating in the workplace. And what what happens with this, this type of solution is you end up designing kind of case study led or scenario driven type of you know um, solutions Mm. which are far less content focused it's more about here's an activity go and do it if you need some help here's the material now all that material doesn't 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 need to be learning or like videos it can be you know a website with you know information it can have videos it can have audio clip it doesn't really matter what the content is right you just again if, if you need to know how to boil an egg you would be quite happy reading a blog post. You know, most people probably go to YouTube, but if you didn't have YouTube available, you'd be quite happy reading a blog post about it or listening to a yeah. podcast. As long as you've, you've got the information there to consume, you can go away and figure it out. So we take all that content, I call it de- deconstructing the course, right? We take all that content out of the course, a bit like deconstructing a meal, right? If you take a, uh, you know, a posh dish, you can de- deconstruct it and you know, present the elements independently. Exactly the same, we can do that with learning. So we can take apart all the, 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 the course in inverted commas, if you like, and we can um, give them the specific activities we want them to practice. And then we provide them with links to the, the, the reference material that they may need in order to complete the activity to the desired standard. And so it's, it's kind of flipping the model. Rather than pushing all the information onto somebody, we're giving them the opportunity to pull it out when they need it and giving them realistic opportunities to practice. Yeah, so so really focusing on the real world, how that actually functions, you know, from a case study perspective, um, as opposed to sort of, you know, here's 50 slides, off you go, click through it and, and we'll tick some boxes and, and you're now, you know, uh, you've learned this this topic or whatever it is. Yeah, absolutely. That's that's really interesting. So so I guess what what would your opinion be on self directed learning where there's a, there's a massive catalog uh, that the organisation might have procured or created um, against you know, maybe the organization outlining some of those business objectives and then sort of guiding the learner through potential business objectives um, as opposed to letting them just, you know, here's our giant library and, and sort of off you go and and, and you, you can pick whatever you like. Yeah, I guess it comes down to motivation. So if a, you know, let's imagine we're talking about a typical business. Um, if a, a typical employee has access to a giant database of training, um, they're only going to really access that and if they're motivated to learn something that they they see as having a direct impact in their you know in their immediate life, right? So um, you know if they think that by going through that course that will enable them to get a better job within the com- company or get a pay rise or maybe leave the company and get a, a better job <laughs> at another company, you know that that's potentially something that they they would do, right? You so I guess that comes down to motivation. Whereas the types of solutions that maybe I've been talking about so far on the podcast, they're more um, focused on solving a specific performance problem Mm. so we are i guess i mean there's there's two sides to that because you might find that the employees are not motivated which is the problem in itself so employees are not motivated to do something properly we have to get to the root cause of that why are they not motivated you know, is it, um, I think some of the examples I told you before, like, you know, the, the wearing of the safety goggles, things like that. But when people, so when people are not motivated, I think we need to design experiences that pulls them into a scenario where they can see the value of um, um, achieving that, those skills. So let's again, go back to our safety, safety goggle example. Now I've kind of gone down that path. Let's imagine that we want everyone on our production line to be wearing safety goggles because they're, you know, dealing with hazardous chemicals, right? Super important. Now, you could put a, you know, uh, wearing safety goggles course on your behemoth catalogue library. No one's going to voluntarily go and do that, right? That that doesn't, to me, sound like something you're going to, you know, encourage people to, 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 to consume. You could do kind of some kind of mandatory course, which forces them to do things. So you could say, right, you've got to do this course in order to keep your job, which you know would probably would probably work. But what you could also do is create an experience where they actually go through a scenario, and you put them in a scenario. So you say, you know, you get there, you started work in the morning, and you know, Dave works works next to you on the production line has asked you to carry this uh, this crate of heavy chemicals to the other side of the factory. Um, what did you do next? And you put them in the scenario and we talk them through the scenario. Okay, so you forgot to put your, your goggles on. 
you slip and you you know you get chemicals in your eye and you're no no longer able to work at the company so you have to you know quit your job and do something else yeah so we put them through an experience where they're like oh wow yeah, i could really imagine that happening and obviously that was me making up a silly scenario but we get these scenarios from you know from the production line floor so we go and speak to people and say we find out from people what happened when you didn't wear your safety goggles oh i actually lost my job and we get the stories from the horse's mouth and we find out um, what the stories are and then we weave those into the experiences that we design so that when people actually you know maybe they're not motivated to wear their safety goggles but we put them through an experience that hopefully um energizes them into you know wearing their safety goggles in future because they've they've seen the consequences of what happens when they don't oh wow i didn't realize you lose your job if you if you um spill chemicals you know and you you know you, you get found out that you weren't wearing safety goggles i didn't know that was a sackable offense kind of thing so i've learned something from that experience and maybe that would change my behavior so i think the difference between what you're saying about the big libraries and the kind of very specific solutions i think the big libraries are great if you've got people who are motivated to go and go and you know access that themselves but for the more specific solutions that's maybe better if you've got people who are not motivated and you need to figure out the root cause of the problem yeah that's really interesting that's a, that's a very uh different approach that i've heard before but it's so relevant that's so true like people don't do the learning if they're not motivated um and that that tends to be the i guess the underlying issue that those large training libraries do have right um that's super interesting your my, my last question for you uh you have a, a really big following uh, in, in the sort of the HR and, and, and learning world. Um, you produce a lot of awesome content. Uh, you have a, a massive mailing list uh, with a lot of people on it. Where can people find you? Where, where can they come and learn more about, about what you do and, and sort of learn a little bit about, about you and, and uh, maybe have a chat if, if, if that sort of stuff is, is of interest to them? Yeah, the best place is my website. Um, so sign up to my, my mailing list, uh, ampune.com. Um, I, I email a short email every day. Just It's, it's specifically aimed to help unful, unfulfilled learning designers um, graduate from kind of order takers into kind of high value business partners. So that's my, my kind of goal with my ultimate mission being to kind of rid the world of ineffective training. Um, but yeah, yeah. <laughs> sorry to cut yeah, you off. Well, that, that is a great mission that is badly, badly needed within the industry. <laughs> Thank you. Uh, but yeah, if, if, if daily emails too much for you, um, I, I post quite a lot on LinkedIn as well. So you can definitely find me there. Yeah, awesome. Well, look, thank you so much for your time today, Ant. Uh, I, I really appreciate it. Um, and, and look, we'll, we'll post this out and, and hopefully people go and, and find out a little bit more about you. Awesome. Lovely to meet you, Blake. Likewise, thank you so much. I'm Blake Provitz, and you're watching the Strategic l and Podcast. If you want to stay up to date with our latest releases, subscribe to our YouTube channel. If you just want the audio, you'll find us on most common podcast platforms, including Spotify and Apple. Enjoy the rest of your day, and we'll see you again soon.